name is Chris. Must confess this is my first video as you can probably tell from the terrible quality but I'm just trying to do it on the cheap and it might not even air, I don't know, I'll see how, see how good I feel about it at the end of the day but welcome anyway. Um, I do have other things on, uh, on, on media I guess. I've got a website that I must confess hasn't been updated for years and years. Um, and I also have a Facebook page which I tend to use more now but all under the name 3R Guitars. Uh, this video is mainly going to be about um, the build of a kind of historic Gibson instrument. Um, and uh, Anyway, I, I thought in the first instance introduce myself and, and show you some of my previous builds that are like um, leading up to this. So let's get on. Um, I do build all sorts of instruments from solid body electrics to, to acoustics. Um, all my acoustic work to date has been with carved arch top guitars. I haven't actually made any flat top ones but one of my absolute heroes with musical instrument making is uh, Orville Gibson who was building his instruments um, around the late 1800s to early 1900s and he took an awful lot of um, existing instruments of the time probably from mainly from European background and changed them around a little bit with his own thoughts on building and um, his main aim really was to make them louder and probably the most famous of his most successful of his builds were mandolins and arch tops I mean, especially with the mandolin he formed it from the bowl back typical Italian sort of style instrument to um, a more of a uh, an arch top and back built more like a, um, a violin and he took that as well and <coughs> um, used it in his guitars as well and like I say in the main to make them to make them louder and if I want a better word to keep up with the band so to speak um, I'm very influenced by his stuff and do a lot of reading on him and I really like it because all his work is out there warts and all because um, you know photography and stuff was around then and uh, you can see all his bad work and all his good work and, all his, and generally his ideas but um, what I tend to do is take um, one of his instruments I particularly like and, and reproduce it but in a modern style so you know it's ultimately more playable um, this is probably one of the first ones I did and this is a copy of a Gibson O guitar um, that he produced in the very early 1900s 1904 something like that maybe even slightly earlier but um, you can see the old-fashioned you know look of it with the with the scroll up here that's very typical of, of Gibson at the time um, now typically Gibson would have actually made his guitars out of um, the sides out of solid just basically cut solid piece of um, mahogany to give the sides and things like that I mean this that was probably done a bit earlier than this instrument but um, anyway I wouldn't do that like I said I like to take instruments like that make them look the same but ultimately more playable so this is actually built like um, a modern jazz guitar with a spruce carved top and uh, bent, bent uh, steam bent sides and a carved back this is actually a maple back and top that's been stained but you'll notice as well that the the neck is much thinner than would have been around god damn it's dusty um, would have been around back in the 1900s um, I mean mainly back then they didn't put steel reinforcement in uh, in necks so they tended to be thicker this one has um, a biflex truss rod um, and a rosewood fretboard there uh, so it's a bit more of a a modern take but looks exactly like a Gibson I reproduced uh, one of the Gibson look lookalike sort of tail pieces for it as well um, so I mean clearly inside I don't know if you can see that there's my makers label it's a bit uh, very much a hom homage to uh, Gibson as well 
Um, so there's no denying what it actually is, even though it will rather cheekily put a Gibson logo on the top. But um, anyway, this is what really floats my boat, boat building old instruments, because it gives me so much inspiration for new stuff. And talking of new stuff, this is my own design of um, guitar. Again, a carved arch top. But so many, so much of the inspiration for this was taken from that Gibson O, mainly the, you know, the scrolls here and things like that. But I wanted to do basically a, mod a modern small um, arch top guitar. It's quite a lot of fun. A lot of everything on this is really original from the, the tailpiece I produced. Um, it's got a quarter sawn spruce top, um, but absolutely gorgeous wood um, around it to that quilted maple back, which is absolutely stunning. And the neck is a gorgeous flame maple. Here's the headstock, um, named after my wife. And uh, I just yeah, this a lot of my guitars, I must confess, turn into a wood pile. But this this one has really hit the nail on the head. Um, I built my own pickup for it, which is very much after a, a Fender wide range with Alnico two magnets and about five thousand winds. Um, you see, it's actually mounted on brass rods, which is a bit of a clue to um, what's going to happen here. <laughs> the actual electrical connections are through those brass rods and you can slide the pickup back and forth to change the tone so there's the, the, there's no tone control um, and just here you've got a little volume wheel kind of thing and out the jack see there and um, yeah this is this guitar was a real success I absolutely love it and everybody who plays it seems to like it's just I can't play very well at all so there we go um, anyway you can see in the background here here's the two moulds for these guitars and I'll be I'll be going on about moulds ad nauseum here but um, anyway uh, just to also say that um, I don't only do guitars and here's what comes next what does come next? Good question. Um, like I say, as well as being uh, influenced by an awful lot of um, old instruments, so they give me fantastic ideas, uh, about two and a half years ago I got quite, um, well, be honest, quite bored with building guitars and, and, and wanted a bit of, uh, bit of a change. Um, God knows why, and probably rather stupidly, I thought, oh, hurdy-gurdies. I heard them being described, I read about them being described as a medieval rave in a box and that made me laugh so much I just thought I've got to make one. Um, I'm a pretty shit guitarist to be honest so um, <coughs> excuse me um, if I went along to a jam night I'd be bloody awful and it would just be embarrassing but I do love playing live but if I take the hurdy-gurdy, I'm the only one, so I can't be bad, you know what I mean? Um, anyway, hurdy-gurdy, quick description. Wheel, turns, like a violin bow, probably would be better in tune. Um, you've got drone strings, you've got um, this hammery string that gives you a rhythm. I won't go into it too deep because I mean it is a guitar side and that's where you play the tune on on on, on that crap there. Um, I did an awful lot of inlay work on this which I wanted to do. I wanted to do a medieval instrument because um, yeah it's got all this kind of groovy stuff on it and, and like this is what I wanted to do. I mean all this is inlaid with the same sort of stuff you can buy from guitars but if you do an inlay that's quite complicated do it on a black wood like ebony because if you make a cock up you can really easily fill it and no one sees it um, rather proud of the headstock um, I have Welsh heritage 
and I actually built this instrument as um, in memory of my dad who died uh, at the beginning of all the COVID stuff. Not a sad thing, well in a way, I mean he was 94 so he had a good old innings and if it wasn't for him I just wouldn't be able to do any of this stuff. So this is for my dad. It's a bowl back instrument, lots of junk in it that you can hit fall in, but um, that's walnut and, um, and ebony. But uh, these things are totally addictive. I'll practice four times, four times a week playing it and actually got to a reasonable standard now, which really makes me happy. Um, anyway, let's get back to guitars. Um, oh, I'll show you one more thing. Moulds again, I'm obsessed with moulds. Well, you can see where the body of that hurdy-gurdy came from. And I have made another one as well, which I play more often, which is a guitar-shaped one. But uh, let's get on now and actually move on to doing something, eh? Well, talking about doing something. Right, let's get on to the project we want to do. Uh, a Gibson Lyre mandolin. Um, now, <clears throat> Back in the late 1800s, uh, the Gibson logo, Orville Gibson's logo for his instruments, was that. Basically a lyre-shaped mandolin. Um, it was only folklore, um, but there were thoughts that he actually made one of these things, or a few of these things, but, but the, n n no instruments were were ever recorded or anything like that um, <clears throat> but later on a someone was looking at a picture of uh, Gibson working at his workbench and, and noticed some uh, templates hanging on the wall behind which which would have um, fitted an instrument like that so um, there was a bit more uh, studying and stuff and a guy in the mid 70s decided to make one he was very, very familiar with um, Orville Gibson's work, so he built one in the way that he thought Orville Gibson would have built it, which is again, actually cut the sides out and everything like that. Now, um, <coughs> I wouldn't attempt to do that, but let's introduce the instrument a bit more. Um, so that's... Uh, no, I'm stepping ahead of myself again here. Let's step back a little bit. So he made this instrument back in the about 75, something like that. And then, lo and behold, a few months later, one turned up at the Gibson factory. And then another one. Oh, talk about buses. But they're the only two existent. So what we're looking at is an instrument that looks like this. And the, the second instrument that turned up basically much the same, but it's felt this one was actually earlier, more of a prototype. There's less ornamentation on it and things like that. But this has ended up in a museum with these extremely valuable dimensions actually on the website. Now the guy who built the thing in 1975, he actually just blew up this on a photocopier. Not the best you can do, because I'm sure he, he, he did massage the dimensions a bit, but photocopiers distort things so much. Um, but this table of dimensions here actually gives the string length from the top nut to the bridge, which is great. So anyway, using a combination of uh, pictures and dimensions. I actually uh, produced a drawing which you can see here. Now I only need to produce half of it because it's a symmetrical instrument actually but um, I think that's very accurate because of the sizes I've got and then scaling it off off printouts and things like that. I think I'm pretty 
pretty close to, um, let's get this showing up a bit better. I um, think I'm pretty close to the, the side of it here, but like all my other instruments, I'm not going to make one in the um, same methods of construction as Orville Gibson. There's a few things I think that are a bit detrimental. Um, cutting out the sides out of solid, um, that wouldn't sit with me very well, not, not, not with ecology and stuff as it is nowadays. I'm not going to hack through a 400 year old mahogany tree wasting all the wood. So we're going to go for bent sides, which is, you know, typical modern construction and I'm sure will sound better. Um, in addition, the string length from the top nut here to the bridge on the original is quoted as 369 millimetres and um, a modern F5 mandolin is 350 and I think that's quite handy because I can actually move the keep, keep the top nut in the same place and move the bridge up a little bit so it's in the middle of the sound hole. Also on this instrument um, the the neck is like flat on the body so you wouldn't get um, a very big brake angle over the bridge. Let's explain brake angle. Can you, can you see how the strings come over the bridge there and supply an amazing amount of downforce on top of the, on top of the, um, the, 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 the sound plate here. So, what I'm going to do is angle the neck more, raise the neck up off the, off the sound board, typical arch top kind of construction, and then angle the neck back a bit more, and then over the bridge so you'll get a bigger brake angle, and the uh, in more downforce on 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 the soundboard. Um, it's not going to sound great, let's be honest. But I just think it's super cool. So, without further ado, far too much damn waffle. Um, we'll get on with starting making it. Okay, um, I'll jump straight in. I've actually cut this out now. Believe me, you cannot template things enough. It may seem it's never going to appear on the final instrument, but this will save you save you hours and lots of cock-ups in the final build. Um, so, well worth doing something like this. It's only eight plywood. Doesn't take long to cut out things like this. So, anyway, um, this template as well is is because it's a symmetrical instrument, as I've said. There's the centre line down here, and I've also put this little tag on. It's exactly the centre line there. So what we're going to do now? Let's get on with making, actually bloody sawing something out. Why not? And what we're going to do is another waste of time, but we're going to make this mould. So let's get on with that and rock and roll. This sheet of plywood. Uh, again, this is, is it 15 mil, something like that. I mean, what, what, whatever they've got in the spares bin at the. Uh, that's probably 18, but it's, that's fine. But whatever they've got in the spares bin that's nice and cheap, reasonable quality, no need to spend a lot on the raw materials on it but it is important to make it accurate. So, let's have a look. Finding a decent pencil. Um, yeah, so what we'll do, first of all, is sharpen the pencil. I wish I was like Ben at um, Crimson Guitars who's got all the nice gadgets and gizmos and even a fancy pencil but I haven't. So first things first. Don't try and do anything without a reasonable um, uh, 
centre line. Let's have a look. First of all, put a centre line on there. Somewhere around the centre. I'll introduce some of my like vital tools as I go. Stuart McDonald fret position ruler, vital, wouldn't be without one. There are a lot of tools I've spent a lot of money on that I wouldn't give time of day, but anyway, always put things back as you can see the shed is beautifully tidy. Right, okay, you'll notice with this template as well, I've left this little tag on here, and that is actually um, where the centre line projects to, so I wanted that on there so I could make sure I'm not going to make the thing splayed. So, line it up perfectly. Oh, I think we're there. <coughs> um, that's where the pencil wouldn't fit. So I actually think we're about, um, now we've got to cut a hole out that shape which is, I think it's going to be a bit of a pain in the arse actually, but um, something we'll have to take our time with and uh, for that use my probably favourite tool of all in the workshop. Let me introduce you to
my bandsaw. Um, this this has done hours and hours and hours of work, and I would not be without it. Um, probably seen better days now, as you can see. It's uh, yeah, well used thing. Um, let me. There we go. Um, it's quite a big one, um, and if if I was starting again in the workshop, I'd probably buy exactly the same one. Um, but for you know, well under a thousand pounds, well under well under probably like three four hundred, uh, you can get a nice one. This has got a cast iron table, needs a damn good cleaning and probably a good service now. But it's a great workhorse. So, ah. Let's get let's get sawing some stuff out then. This could take a while. Okay, one thing I've decided to do before I start is um, change the blade for a narrower blade because it's easy to go around corners, and I think it's got some pretty tight ones. Um, one thing to know about band saws is they're not like the most accurate of uh, tools to use. I mean, they're not like a table saw where you can cut like a dead straight line every time. With a bandsaw, once you've used a blade to cut curves, it will never cut a straight line ever again. So, yeah, keep the blades separate, the ones you use for, to cut a straight line and the ones you use to cut curves, keep them separate. And buy new blades frequently because once a blade goes off, it goes off and you can never cut a straight line. So, let's get weaving and give this a go. Okay, um, I suppose we're about halfway through making um, making this mould. Uh, well, no, not halfway through, but halfway through trying to trying to cut the part of it out. Um, as you can see, um, 
you know it's, it's not really important that you keep it in one piece because you're making another one of these exact things to go on top to bring up the thickness so you can overlap the joints and screw them in so feel free to cut it out you know whatever e easiest way you can and the bandsaw can be a bit of a pain in the ass because you haven't got a huge area to swing things about but one of the advantages with um, you know one of the nice things about making the, these templates is that it actually um, if you like shows you where you're going to have potential problems building the instrument um, you know you you're building a prototype here basically in a, in a way so I always thought that um, you know as experience from other guitars and things like that um, where you get tight curves you're not I mean bending bending around this edge here is very easy with the wood and you know, obviously we'll get onto that at the time but where you get to areas like here around these tight curves here it's not going to be possible to bend the wood nicely around there and in violins and things where you get tight curves and other instruments it's very typical that an area like this is actually done in a block so the bent side will come round and join the block somewhere somewhere up here where the bend is less severe you are really not going to bend a bit of wood accurately around there it's just going to be a, a, a huge frustration and a mess so my basic thoughts are that I can make a block something somewhere something around this in there so make this part out of a solid piece and then here cut a rebate in so that the side can come round and and go in that rebate and it, it, equally here and it's very typical of a musical instrument um, the problems I'm gonna have with this mold is let me show you um, try it down here is basically where we have this swan neck on the design of the instrument again I'll do this in a block the same as the, the same as the top but the problem I have is when I'm building the mold here this actual bit of wood is the only thickness I've got supporting this whole thing and I'm not sure what my best plan will be whether it will be either to I mean I want to have want to get this curve right for the bent sides um, so what I can do is when I make these blocks I can temporarily temporarily stick this bit of the mold to the the blocks and then detach it once the sides are in place or I think what well, I, I will try and cut it out initially and somehow try and squeeze as much strength out of that little piece as I can but uh, I, we'll see how it goes and this again uh, like I say this is the advantage of having um, doing a mold because you foresee these problems and so I'm going to try and cut this cut this piece out and uh, we'll go from there and maybe it'll be okay maybe it won't but um, I'd like to keep it attached it just makes a nicer job of it really so we'll come back to that and see what happens
Okay, so we've got the basic, um, the, the first layer of the, the, the mould very roughly cut out. Um, I quickly decided that um, it was going to be impossible to uh, do this part in the actual mould. It, it would just be too weak because like I say, this, this area here, um, that thickness of wood in there would have been just the only bit holding it on and it would have been too weak. So um, I'm really happy with, with this arrangement. So what I can basically do is, as I was talking before about um, making the blocks for the scroll areas, roughly where the, the, the shaded portion is, when I come to bend in the sides, I can make these blocks this being a very rough uh, example of one, fit them in the mould um, and then make some kind of template up like this, a section like that and actually just um, stick that with a couple of dabs of super glue actually on the block and then I can build in the sides, I think that that would be a far far easier way to do it so I'm happy with that. So the next stage is to get this, all the edges on um, here like filed and uh, sanded to, um, to the accurate outline of the instrument and then we can get on with making the next, the next one of these to screw on the top and like I say I'll do the saw cuts in a different place so um, they'll be overlapping and uh, screw it all together so it'll make a solid mould. Rock and roll. Uh, this is another one of my favourite bits of kit in the shed. Um, something you can pick up from uh, Machine Mart or somewhere like that for a for a for a £250, something like that. This one's worked fairly hard. Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very handy tool. Um, it's called an oscillating spindle sander. Um, Bobs up and down, the sanding bobbins that I'll be using today can be replaced by um, a belt sander very quickly, very good bit of kit. And what I'll be doing is pretty self-explanatory, sanding around the edge of that. Um, I won't keep you uh, videoing that because it's fairly... Um, quick but uh, effortless um, exercise. See you back later. Well, back again. Um, here we are uh, with the mould now after spending about half an hour at the bobbin sander. Um, you won't get, with the bobbin sander, you won't get the sides, you know, you'll get them to size but they'll have a bit of wibbly wobbliness about it because basically the bobbin sand is round. Um, this tool here is a Japanese Shinto file and oh my god, it's the best 17 pounds I've ever spent in my life I think. Sharp as anything, it says that you're running his fingers across it, but it really makes short work of knocking things down to knocking things down to size and what you really want to do is you know the advantage with the bobbin sander is it keeps the the cut nice and square um, perfect so when you address parts that aren't quite flat or something like that um, basically you know try and try and keep the whole thing square um, easier said than done I guess but as long as it's nice but you can see now that um, our original like, pattern we are getting really nice nice fit there so I'm quite happy with that really um, so I'll just finish off the odd bits doing these little notches in here and things like that and then we'll get back to making the, the second one of these to stick on top. 
Yep, so now we've got the um, the the accurate template made, um, body mould template made, the half of it. Now I've just roughed out um, another one um, that will go on the top to build up the thickness. This one is uh, cut, obviously, um, with a with a bit of a bit of spare around it and what we'll do is we'll glue this all together now and then there's a very quick way to make both these exactly the same and accurate so let's stick some glue on it what are we going to do first um, yeah okay You know, in any of my um, uh, guitar projects, I only ever use tight bond original glue. Um, don't use any of the Mark II tight bond glues or the outdoor exterior one. I think tight bond original is uh, is about the best for guitar building. I mean, if you were, if you're doing um, you know vintage stuff you may want to consider hide glue I'm not a huge well yeah I like it it sticks very well but for me oh my god if you ever spill a bit of it and leave it it stinks the place out and gets quite I mean it's an organic stuff and uh, don't don't ever be tempted to lick your fingers after it you'll end up with a with a dose of the trots for like a good few days so I'll stick to the tight bond original. The nice thing about tight bond is it is it 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 dries hard. It's got no rubber rubbery um, quality to it, so it sands nicely. It cleans off nicely. So it's a water-based glue, but so we can get this done. I've already drilled a couple of pilot holes in, um, so I can position it right. screws the right length. Always too long. Cut them off. Just put a couple more screws in.
Okay then, here's the uh, the basic thing screwed together now. Um, got one of my favourite tools out, a router. Um, this one's got a bearing guide on the top. Um, now what you've got is basically the, the accurate um, layer of this template that you made is on the, is on the top. Um, I can use the bearing guided router to whiz round and cut the roughly cut one the same. Um, I would say you do this, would normally do this on a router table where the router's underneath the table and the cutter comes out of the top, but um, I don't know, router tables frighten me a little bit. Um, I will use them of course, but if I've got the option of keeping my hands a good six inches above the cutter I'd rather, ra rather do that and keep my fingers. Um, so yeah we'll just whiz around this now and um, go from there. Well, might be able to see better here. Well, here we go then. Um, have the basic template now made. It's butt in the centre. Um, so it's yeah, as made on the on the videos. I'll be going up and tidying, tidying up around the inside. It's uh, one of the things you can know. I mean, I, I, should say up you know I, I continued on with the router went round the outside so you can see that it's keeps it nice and nice and square in there what well, you can't really see but nice and square um, and saves you having to uh, sand and file the edges the router does the job for you I'll be going up and cleaning cleaning all this up um, if you have made uh, a, a bit of a Cod's wallet of it, and so you've got one area that's got a nasty dip in it, or something like that. I mean, don't go throwing it away because um, you know you can always fill fill that area. Car car body fill is pretty good, and then then resand it to the right profile. But I think we've got this um, pretty nice, as you can see. Um, this is like. A, very accurate fit in there so I mean if I put it the other way around because I haven't cleaned out the corners yet but see that way it's quite a nice accurate fit in there and down here so I think we've got we're, we're on the right track there which uh, is all very nice and tomorrow or in a few days time um, we will start making the blocks that fit that fit in here to form the edge. The pattern is 35 millimeters thick, um, and the sides of the the the, 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 the mandolin, these rib bent rib part sides, are meant to be about 33, 34 mil thick. So I think we we dead on with that. Um, so all good. Template made. It's not going to contribute anything to the final instrument but it's uh, it's a necessary building block and uh, yeah all done so back for the next episode soon thank you very much <laughs>